Welcome to Sober Solutions. We are a weekly recovery podcast, not affiliated with any particular 12-step or recovery program. However, you may hear us mention them. My name is Jason, and I'm an alcoholic and addict. My name is Chris, and I'm an alcoholic and addict. My name is Ben, I'm an alcoholic and addict. And welcome back to Sober Solutions Podcast. Tonight is episode 53. And tonight we have a very special guest, one of my sober family, John C. from Philadelphia. How you doing, John? Hey, y'all. I'm anxious. Let's do this. <laughs> well, that's par for the course for you. So um, before we get into uh, having you introduce yourself to our listeners, I just want to give a big shout out to Chris. Chris, happy 21 months today. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Didn't even realize it until you mentioned it, but. You know, it happens like that, right? Like we stop counting these months because it becomes a lifestyle. It really does. So John, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Um, well, yeah, I also have 21 months as of yesterday. So we're like twinsies, Chris. Congratulations. Yay. So yeah, my name is John. I am not a doctor of any science things. I just am an avid enthusiast of trying to cure anxiety in my brain as much as physically possible. Um, I, like I said, I've been sober for 21 months. I got sober during COVID on Zoom, which was quite the challenge. Um, I often feel a little bit left left out and left behind when people are like, oh yeah, you know, I got sober in the rooms and all this. I'm like, yeah, I got sober on a screen. Um, I actually prefer it. I tend to be a little bit more shy. Uh, so I like the screens. I think they give me some added protection. Um, I'm from Philadelphia. Um, I've lived here for probably 22 years, something like that. Um, but I'm originally from Wisconsin. So if you hear a little bit of twang in my accent that comes in and out, that's where that's from. A lot of my story comes from growing up as a preacher's kid. Um, well, I've heard this story a lot actually from other religious people, but every once in a while you'll run into another preacher's kid and there's sort of a story of the preacher's kids being kind of a hot mess when they grow up just generally from the pressure and mindset of trying to be perfect all the time and trying to keep this image up. And it's a difficult thing to keep going. And especially for me as a kid and growing up gay as a preacher's kid, there was a lot of pressure on me to conform to something that I don't think I really could ever live up to. And I've always had insomnia from birth. Essentially, I used to have night terrors. I've just always been that kid. Jason and I have been friends for some time now. And I sort of joke with him that inside of my mind would not be a fun place for anyone to ever visit. It's just a lot of noise in there. I was worried when I first got sober that alcohol not being a part of my life was going to be detrimental to me staying sane. And I found it to be the reverse is true. I found a lot of peace of mind in sobriety and the programs that I'm in. I'm excited to talk a little bit about the sort of amateur psychology that I found, um, especially from a book that uh, I have been reading called Unwind the Anxiety by Judson Brewer. And I just am so excited for other people with anxiety to read this book because it has very much changed my life. So uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you for your story, John. Um, you mentioned that you're an anxious person and that through sobriety, you got a peace of mind. Can you expand on how you got to that point? Was it because you got sober or was it the practices that you are partaking in while in recovery? Um, I think sobriety brought me to curiosity of sort of analyzing myself. I think specifically alcohol was a numbing agent for me that really helped keep me even keeled, um, which obviously was not a good way to cope. And I think specifically for me, I am in AA. Um, I know that you guys talk about all sorts of different kinds of programs on here. AA was where I ended up and just sort of the concept of, and I'm going to talk about a little bit of, of a growth mindset and what a growth mindset is sort of switching your frame of mind to valuing growth and that failure starts to become more of an opportunity to learn and sort of just the excitement and adrenaline and dopamine rush you feel from doing better, uh, taking steps towards 
helping yourself and being proud of yourself. And, and I think, you know, a lot of sobriety programs and a lot of 12 step programs and things like that sort of emphasize that, put structure to that. Uh, I don't think I could have done that. Um, I mean, I've had therapy for many, many years, but I don't think I could have done that not sober. It was just too easy to go back to the bottle. There's a lot of books that I've read and more specifically in business about growth mindset and how failure is a learning tool and how we need to use failure as a learning tool. I've also read, I, I can't even, I was trying to think of this book before, a book about how we, anxiety can also be used as a tool. And I know for some people, it's very debilitating. For me, I found that when I was using, it was debilitating and I would overthink, I would overanalyze, it would just consume my mind. And since I've been in recovery, I've really tried to focus on using my anxiety as a tool to direct my actions. Are you getting better with your anxiety because of, you mentioned mindfulness, meditation before, and how do you use your uh, anxiety when it comes up? That's a great question. I'm clinically diagnosed with anxiety. I think for me, anxiety has never been a tool I've been able to harness or use. I think for me, um, understanding why normal anxiety is sort of an evolutionary tool that gets us to think through problems and problem solve was useful for me to understand that mine was not particularly useful and doesn't need to be nurtured. My anxiety does not need to be harnessed. It needs to be examined in my opinion. And that's just my opinion. Um, and I think that was helpful for me because it allowed me to sort of take the emotional aspect out of it. So you're thinking, man, everything stinks. You know, you get into this really negative mindset and you take a step back and you say, you know, why am I feeling this? What's really going on here? And just the action of stepping away from your anxiety, it's called like an anxiety loop. You get stuck in sort of a feedback loop of anxiety where you're just not really going anywhere. It's not helping you solve any problems. Um, I think for me, it wasn't necessarily harnessing that as a tool it was sort of stepping away from it to see what's really going on. And then sort of digging a little deeper into like, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? What's the problem? Let's solve it in a different way. In my brain, anxiety is just like a, a bag of screaming squirrels. It's not something I want to use. It's something I want to put aside and examine why it's happening. So we keep using this word tool. And I want to go back to a comment that was made earlier about how we can use failure as a learning tool. And I wish I did that because as it relates to recovery and sobriety, failure equals relapse for me. And relapse is such a huge part of my story. I wish I learned from it. I wish I used that as a tool to finally get me to where I needed to be. And partly I did, you know, I think I learned a little bit more each time that I failed but what other tools do you use? I know you mentioned mindfulness and meditation. What other tools and how do you differentiate between mindfulness and meditation? Again, I want to reiterate, I uh, am an amateur. So please consult your local therapist if you want to talk about mindfulness or, or do some research. But for me, one of the first things that really helped, and a lot of people have talked about this on your show and, and out there in the world is exercise and anxious people will tell you time and time again like there's this just vibration of energy that you can tire out and you know i'm never more productive than when i've just gotten done you know working out pretty hard i go right into work usually after my five or six a.m workout and i'm focused and i'm not stressed in traffic and i just am too tired physically <laughs> to really be buzzing um, with anxiety. That's been really helpful. But yeah, meditation and mindfulness are two separate things that are both extremely, extremely helpful. And I was so, again, I thought meditation was so lame when people would talk about it. It just this like hippie nonsense, um, you know, crystals and sitting on a hill and doing whatever. And early on in my recovery on the Zoom meetings, I was attending there was this sort of not well attended Tuesday meditation meeting. And I remember going to it. And I think the first one I went to, it was just like quiet. It was just like silence for 15 minutes. And I was like, this is 
terrible. I don't want to do this. Like, I'm not a quiet person. Um, you know, this isn't helpful. And I started looking on YouTube of all places. Everybody has an app they like to use. Everybody likes to do all these things. I would just type in guided meditation for anxiety. And it was just a plethora of these like amazing 20, 15 minute, 20 minute, you know, meditation guides. And I, I started volunteering to chair that meeting. I chaired that meeting for like seven months and people came, they liked it. I, I got a sense of pride from doing it. And for me, I need some British person guiding me through this meditation. I don't want a silent thing. I want somebody to sort of calmly walk me through what I need to be doing. And I, to this day, still will put on the, on the TV, on my YouTube app when I need it. It got to a point where I started to feel the difference, like a natural high, I guess you could call it. Uh, 20 minutes in, I would just feel very good. And, you know, we're all addicts and alcoholics. So when you find something that makes you feel good, you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then the skills you learn from it start to learn how to breathe, control your breathing. And then I started to discover mindfulness. Um, as active mindfulness and mindfulness is just sort of being aware of what you're doing instead of allowing yourself to drift into a, a state of mind where you're on autopilot. So the easy, easiest examples I use when I describe it is when I'm driving my car and I start to think, what if I get fired today? Like, what if, what if you know, uh, the world ends tomorrow? I start to say, like, I am driving my car. There is a car in front of me. This car is blue. Um, I need to use my brakes now. And it takes you out of that feedback loop of panic. And I start to use it every day. Um, I find myself literally just saying, my dog is sitting here. I like... I'm on a podcast because, you know, this is a high stress situation for someone with anxiety to be speaking to, you know, people and it helps. It lowers your heart rate. Your, it snaps you back into where you need to be. There are two tools that I definitely use. Also, I can't say enough about exercise though. Like just wear yourself out. <laughs> you can't get in trouble when you're too tired to move. <laughs> I completely agree with you. You pretty much just named three out of five of my tools and exercise is definitely number one. One thing I stopped doing when I was using is just exercising. And it's this domino effect of you become more lazy, you get more tired, you get more depressed. And the more you don't work out, the more it just goes downhill and counter to that, the more you work out, the better you feel, the more energy you feel and the easier it is to, I think have that mindfulness present mentality when you're working out. When I do work out, it's very easy for me to be present, to be mindful of where I am, what I'm doing. Some other tools that I use besides meditation, and I love guided meditations as well. I'm not smart enough to literally meditate by myself or have enough practice, I'll say, but love guided meditations. Jason and I actually met and then we just started going to meditations in the morning at rehab, which I don't think there's ever been a person that left a meditation was like, I really wish I didn't do that today. I think the only other tools that I use are I talk to people a lot and I drive a lot. So when I'm in the car, I pretty much have 20 or 30 numbers that I just cycle through. And that takes me back to being mindful. And really, in my opinion, being mindful is really about being present. And I'm able to do that when I'm just talking to people because it focuses my mind. And Jason, you know, you were talking about tools and that the question came up. I think the last thing that I've been doing lately is I'm very task oriented. So I'll list out simplistic things that I could get done and just checking it off. So I remember you mentioned making your bed in the morning. I've started like adding that to my list just so I can have that physical thing. Like I check that box. Lastly, is I've been trying to read a lot. I think that is another way going back to being mindful. That, that really helps me engage my mind and be present. Jason, what do you use? What are some tools? You both named exercise. I can physically feel myself like not just getting anxious, but like jittery. And if I have too much of that energy built up now, I have started yoga and a regular yoga practice to take me out of that worrying state 
And just like both of you were talking about focusing on specific things. And even if I can't do the pose that the instructor is telling us to do, I try my best and I try and focus on my form just like I do at the gym. And that gets me to be present. And Chris, I echo what you were saying, talking to other people. And I think that helps like it does in a meeting or talking to you, John, or talking to you, Chris or CJ, or my sponsor, or even my partner who has over 10 years of sobriety. And he understands my anxiety and I understand his anxiety. And so we get the ability to work with each other in conversation and through conversation. You know, I really think that's something that is really underrated as a tool is just talking to someone. I, I think that's why I share in meetings is I'm thinking about something, I'm focusing on something and I need to get it out. And that is a huge tool that I use to get rid of my anxiety. So I wanna go back to this book, Unwinding Anxiety by Judson Brewer. So tell us a little bit more about that book and some of the pearls that you pulled out from it. So this book was given to me by my mother, which whenever my mom sends me a book, I'm always like, great, this is gonna be terrible. It was a great book though. Basically, it is sort of a very easy to read breakdown of the science kind of behind anxiety and, and our brains and how they function. It sort of takes the emotional part out of it and just gets into the less clinical but more layman terms of anxiety in our brains. Basically, it starts to talk a bit about like a hierarchy of behaviors in our brain. Our brains are sort of wired like cave people. We are built for survival. Anxiety is part of that. It's also which I found very fascinating, the, our reward center and the, the area of our brain which uh, handles anxiety uh, are the same area. So you're playing Candy Crush and it's lighting up from that reward. You're also lighting that same area up when you're having a, a, a panic attack or an anxiety loop. Um, when we have to survive back in the ancient days, you know, we would find sweet food or, or fatty food and our pleasure centers would light up because we needed the calories to survive. Uh, if we needed to figure out a complex problem, our anxiety center would, would light up and we would figure out how to survive. You know, the less difficult life becomes as we have, you know, into the modern age, it, it's no longer appropriate for us to sit and eat 20 candy bars. It's also no longer appropriate for us to sit in constant anxiety. So, you know, we have to train our brains uh, through reward to avoid, you know, a feedback loop, uh, an anxiety feedback loop. And it's the same with, with alcoholism or any addiction. You know, you can't just say, I don't want to do, when you're an addict, you can't just say, I don't want to do this anymore. And then to stop, a lot of times you need to train yourself uh, to change that habit. And, you know, that's why we have programs. That's why we, we work together. That's why we have therapy. That's why we do all those things is we're training our brain to change a habit that didn't necessarily work for us, but was lighting up a part of our brain that made it feel like it was working for us. And that was very helpful for me as, as a person with anxiety to just sort of say like, this isn't a failing on my part. This isn't me having weakness. This is something that kept my ancestors alive and it's just not quite working out great for me. So let's just take a step back and look at that. Um, you know, and, and reward-based learning is, is sort of the topic of this book. It's sort of saying, you know, let's break down what anxiety is. Let's think about ways to examine it and to self, uh, examine. And then let's think of ways to reward ourselves for trying something different. We talked a little bit about the growth mindset and learning to, see growth as a reward and it all comes down to dopamine like we can say we're complex higher beings and everything has a, a meaning but really we're chasing that high that dopamine high and feeling like a complete person little by little makes us feel good and so i can sit here today and say hey i'm on a podcast about anxiety and you know, two years ago, I was spiraling into 
the abyss, like that makes me feel good. I'm going to keep doing that. And maybe, you know, next year I'll teach a, another uh, a meditation class and that'll make me feel good. And all this is doing is teaching us habits that get us out of our head and doing things that are, are helpful and healthy for us. Does Judson Brewer go into addiction? Is it based around addiction or is it really based around just reward-based thinking and that process? It touches on it. Um, he is constantly referencing other colleagues that he works with. One of them is an addiction specialist, talks about food addiction. It's not about addiction, but it's so close and adjacent that it's like, you can tie it to it very easily. I mean, thinking about specifically, I'll speak on AA, giving out coins. I mean, I'm all jazzed to get my coin. Like my sponsor got me this really cool coin. I have it a little like velvet case. It's really awesome. That's a reward based learning tool. Like I don't want to take away from, from how cool it is, but it's like, it's the toy and the, and the happy meal. Like you really want that toy is the, is the tiny little burger worth it? Like, no, you want that cool Power Rangers toy. We learn as human beings reward equals, you know, something good. And so it works with recovery, it works with addiction, it works with anxiety, it works with all sorts of things. Same thing with exercise. You know, you get a dopamine rush from exercise. You get a different shaped body. Maybe um, you get praise from other people, you get attention. Like these are not fully altruistic things that we're doing, but the reward changes how we think and feel about them. I think it's interesting that you said we chase that toy. And I agree, it's the happy meal toy. What I find interesting is we do do that. And we used to, you know, chase this dopamine high. However, we were talking about mindfulness and meditation before. And in my opinion, mindfulness and meditation is about being present and pushing away all material things and just being, right? When you're mindful, right? You don't want to have this material like sense, but I agree with you. Like reward-based learning is about switching what you're chasing, correct? Instead of a drug, you're chasing healthy things. So I want to touch on that idea of the reward-based incentivizing around anxiety and this reward-based mindset. I love your analogy of the coins. I also could say that counting days is like that too. The next day that you get and the next day that you get, that's instant gratification, that's instant reward. Something that we went back to when we were drinking and drugging, right? The moment I took a swig of that booze or hit that crystal meth pipe, it was automatic reward. What I kept going back to is your comment about exercise because exercise is not immediate gratification from a looks perspective, in my opinion. I feel better, but I'm not going to look better after one time going to the gym. So I think that delayed reaction of gratification and reward also is positive as well. However, I noticed that in my in my fitness journey, I had to be mindful of how I rewarded myself because at times I would get deflated and say, oh, this isn't working. And so I had to figure out different ways to really show myself that it was working. And so it takes a lot of work to be able to be actively in our own self-care. And I'm interested to see if that book has that concept of, of self-care in it, because that's what I kept hearing when you were talking about that reward-based mindset. That is a great point, because when you're in active addiction, it is very hard to have that futuristic uh, mentality. You know, you, you mentioned working out and not looking instantly good or instantly jacked or whatever you're going for. I mean, it's the same with uh, like falling in love, right? Like you, you're dating this guy or girl and you don't just fall in love on day one, but if you keep bringing them a glass of you know water at night, if you give them a kiss, if you, if you just remember the little things, eventually there's a day that you fall in love and that person falls in love with you. And it's very hard for people in active addiction to conceptualize that everybody that I know 
and I'll speak for me, wants that instant gratification, wants that instant high. So that that's a great point, Jason. And it's just something that you learn through recovery that you can wait and doing the next right thing. And you mentioned counting days, you know, you don't get to a year on day one, you just can't, it's just not physically possible, but you do it one day at a time, one day at a time. And all of a sudden it's a year later. I think um, to sort of jump on what both of you are saying is, you know, like, okay, so I'm not seeing results with exercise right away. I think one of the really amazing things about being in a program, whatever program that might be, is that you're just kind of attacking it from like 20 different angles at the same time. You're constantly being told, do this, do that, do this, do that. It's never just one thing. It's always like, you should try this, you should do this. And you're trying 20 things at once. And eventually one of them feels good at that moment. So good example of that is I hate exercising or I hated exercising. I also have uh, chronic insomnia within a day or two of starting to work out. I was so tired. I was sleeping better. That was enough to get me up the next day. Same thing with mindfulness and meditation. It's boring to sit quietly. Even if you are just listening to somebody tell you you're in a waterfall and your you know, spirit uh, guide is a bird. I mean, that's not interesting or cool, especially for someone with a really busy brain within like two or three weeks. Like I said, I got that really weird sort of rush of peace. It felt very chemical. If I'm honest with you, I don't mean to trigger anybody, but the first time that that happened, I was like, that was nice. And then the first time I had a panic attack and I went to that and was instantly calmed, I just felt less panicked. And for someone who has an anxiety disorder, feeling less panic is a reward. Uh, I'm sure somebody out there is listening and knows what it feels like to be in the middle of a work day. I have to get up and leave your desk immediately um, because you, you feel like you're kind of dying um, to be able to have a tool in your tool belt to calm you down for a second. That's the reward. And, and that kind of goes back to whether you're in a program or whether, whether we're talking about this book, the reward is the growth. It's also the, the curiosity you feel about yourself, the thing that we all kind of avoided um, by using and drinking. I'm speaking for myself, but I didn't want to self-examine. I didn't want to know why I was anxious. I just didn't want to be anxious. I didn't want to feel like this. I just wanted to stop. Now I think I feel a great sense of peace of mind when I am sitting in bed and it's two in the morning and I'm having an anxiety attack to stop and say, all right, what am I feeling in my body? Not why am I imagining how I messed up at work? Like, what am I feeling? Where does it feel weird? Okay, it's in my chest. Why does it, why do I feel it in my chest? Like, just to, to be curious, take a minute, step back. That in and of itself calms me down. It makes me feel proud. In that moment, that pride is the reward. And I find myself falling asleep within the next, you know, 25 minutes or so. The fact that I can do that and I could not do that before creates a new like hierarchy of behavior that says if I keep doing this as opposed to going to get wasted I will be happy like this I will feel like this in a sustained way so yes working out that first year and a half maybe two years <laughs> has not given me the results that I wanted but I'm sleeping better I feel better so there's three things that I want to just touch on and the first was towards the end when you were saying how I'm not seeing the results that I, I wanted. And yet the next words that came out of your mouth were, but I'm sleeping at night. So sometimes the results that we're looking for aren't the ones we find, but the ones that we need are the ones that show up. The other two items are that examination that you started to do after you got sober and you started to examine your anxiety and you started to look into why I'm anxious. And the analogy that popped into my head is your examination was equal to me going to the dentist for the first time in years after getting sober. When I was high, when I was drunk, I never went to the dentist because I didn't care about taking care of myself. Your examination of why I'm anxious was you taking care of yourself, that self-care aspect of it. And then I really applaud you for the healthy substitute that you've made because when you just said, gosh, I remember the first time that I got anxious and I went right to a meditation. 
instead of I went to a bottle, you know, and it's that healthy substitute that you made. It might not be the cookie and the cake and the things that we could have in moderation, in my opinion, but for you, it's that meditation or that mindfulness that take you out of your anxious state right then and there. Yeah. And it's also the skills you build up. Like I don't, I'm not going to sit here and say, I, I do a meditation every day. I don't need to do a meditation every day. It's the skills you build up that you can sort of bypass it without having to listen to something. You can just breathe. You can, you can get out of your head a lot easier. And it's like exercise. Um, you know, you build muscle memory and that's what we're doing every day with all of these things. We're building healthy choices, muscle memory. Now, if I could only put down the food that I'm not supposed to be eating, I think we'd all be in a better spot, but hey, you know, nobody's perfect. John, thank you for expanding on the book, mindfulness, meditation. You know, I really, I really learned a lot about anxiety and how it affects people, especially when, you know, in the retrospect of addiction. Uh, one thing we'd like to ask all our guests is if there was one thing, one thing that you would give advice to the newcomer, what would it be? Put your effort into it. Put it all into it. Don't do it halfway. If you're admitting to yourself that you have a problem and you believe it, just do it. Just put whatever it is you have chosen to do to get yourself there. Just do what you can do each and every day, 24 hours a day, but put your heart and soul into it. Make this your identity. I absolutely love that because that was something I was never able to do. I could never be thorough in my program. And the moment that I was is the moment that I got two years. So John, congratulations on your 21 months. It's so great to have you on the show. Yeah. Chris, of course, happy 21 months to you as well. And as always, each and every one of our episodes is dedicated to the still sick and suffering alcoholic and addict, especially the individual who's going to pick up for the first time tonight. Have a great night, guys. Bye. Have a great night. We appreciate your liking and subscribing to our podcast. If you liked what you heard today and would like to support our podcast, feel free to Venmo a dollar to our virtual basket at Sober Solutions Podcast. We want to hear from you too. If you have a comment, question, topic, or would like to come on the show, Find us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at Sober Solutions Podcast. Or you can shoot us an email to Sober Solutions Podcast at gmail.com. Find us on Apple Podcast and Spotify. And if you like what you've heard, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show.